Okay. Yeah, sir. Cool. Um, hi. <laughs> I'm this one. Michael's this one. Oh. Um, we work at Huge. And uh, what we talk about today is, uh, that was Michael's idea, gifts and giving in the cognitive age, the thought that counts. Black Friday is only eight days away, guys. Time to be ready. Right. We want all of you guys to get ready. So that's, it's really a preparation course for the best gifts. No, but what we're really um, thinking, so here's the idea. Uh, we want to talk about, Michael, you're a data guy. I'm a designer. And we want to talk about um, what opportunities there are in the idea of you know, artificial intelligence and everything being automated with the automation of gifting. So we're going to talk about what a gift is anyways, then how we could potentially do it, and then we'll all talk together. So <laughs> gifting mayhem, <laughs> every year, everyone goes fucking insane trying to find the right gifts for people you might or might not even know very well. And it really is just a scramble. It's expensive. So we're spending about uh, 64 billion estimated for 2015 is what we spend. Um, but here's the crazy part. Estimated e-commerce gift returns 2015 holiday season was about 30% of all gifts were returned. So that's a pretty low hit rate, right? That's like two out of three gifts are okay, are not returned, one is gone. Um, and we all know this feeling, right? You want kind of this <laughs> to happen. You want everyone to be super, super excited. But sometimes you get this guy, right? You're like, uh, and if you really mess up, then you get this. So it's really hard and the struggle is real. So we trust algorithms with basically everything else in our lives, right? But it's interesting, like, whether they've made their way into gift giving. So, for example, we trust algorithms with, hey, well, you know, we're in the house, so thanks, Spotify. We trust to pick our music for us. And next, we trust algorithms to pick our next movie. Uh, because you watched Butter, maybe you'd like toast. Um, <laughs> and we trust algorithms to recommend soulmates to us. It's like already kind of an intensely personal space to play. Or maybe if you've got less time, you know, more of a shorter term objective. But what, what's kind of funny about, oh, and of course, we trust algorithms to predict who's going to be president, right? That, that worked out pretty well, right? I think uh, anyone saw the news? I haven't. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, but where we haven't really trusted algorithms so much on the next slide is gifts. And like, you know, right now, when you're shopping for somebody, who can name like a service out there that's kind of like your magic go-to for recommending gifts for people? There are curated lists, but algorithmically, not so much. Why is that? So um, first of all, people have tried. So even going back 2008, 2009, up to 2011, there were a number of different attempts. For example, Etsy's Gift Finder in 2011 connected to your Facebook profile and magically didn't do so well. Um, this is pretty rubbish, unfortunately, and yeah, this is like the laziest aunt you have trying to buy you. I don't know how many of you have lazy aunts who try to use Etsy to buy gifts, but anyway, so they pulled the plug on this, and then on the next slide, you know, Walmart tried really hard. You can tell they were so proud of this little shoppy cat. I so like proud. Cat. He's so cute. He's cute. Yeah. I'm popping out of a bag. <laughs> and then this was killed off after like a couple months. Um, and then there was Hunch, and I couldn't even find a picture of Hunch anymore. I love that it's like, once you've been disambiguated by Wikipedia, you know things didn't end well for you. The site was apparently closed down in March 2014. It was actually bought by eBay and became kind of part of the eBay tech stack, but it was another attempt as like a purchase recommender service that did really, well, tried to do gifts. So, so what's interesting now is gift recommenders that are kind of like on the up and up are actually flaunting the fact that they are not automated, right? That, that the whole thing of Canopy is work curated by humans. And here they are talking about it's a different kind of recommendation. Wait, it's not a different kind of recommendation. It's the only kind of recommendation people are actually using right now. But they feel this need that, no, 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 we're, we're not like those other automated guys that no one is actually using. Um, so can we do better? Well, yes, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> we can. So, Michael and I spent some time 
and indulge us um, just to see how we could actually automate GIFT. And the first thing that we have to do is we have to understand the anatomy of a GIFT and what a GIFT is, because a GIFT is a pretty complex thing, and we are trying to untangle what it actually is. So a GIFT is not just me buying something and handing it to you. A GIFT is actually a very old social ritual to express affection, right? These guys gave baby Jesus stuff, everyone gave people stuff, and it was, back in the days, a really important sign of a lot more, a really important political gesture, and a sign of a lot more than an expression of, of affection. And so when we look at the anatomy of a gift, we want to look in the psychology of what happens during gifting. So there's two parties involved. There's the giver and the gifted. Um, and the giver has, you know, a goal. They want to please. They want to express fondness. They want to prove or and or deepen the relationship. Um, and they potentially want to surprise and delight, right? And on the other side, if this all goes well, the gifted feels appreciated, feels closer to the person that has been giving, and is surprised. So essentially, gifting is a form of social manipulation. What is really happening here is the idea of the giver trying to gain influence, trying to impress, and trying to communicate through this gift. And on the gifted, there's the, the inherent want to feel understood and feel known. That's where gifts often go horribly wrong, or oh, this person doesn't even know me. They want to be flattered, but they're also going to naturally be indebted to the giver. So it is actually a very complex situation. If we look at this and look at all the factors that go in here, then the perfect gift starts to emerge and the, the formula for a perfect gift starts to emerge. It's a lot about the gifted, right? The person I am giving something to. It's a little bit about the relationship that I have with this person and ideally a little bit about me as well, which is what makes this gift a unique exchange between these two parties and not just anything. So, the perfect gift essentially could look something like this. There's the part about the gifted, that's all the pink stuff. So there's, I need to understand the personality of the gifted. I need to understand their aspirations because I'm not only giving them something that they are right now, but in order to make it a magical gift, I want to understand where they want to go and I want to hit on these deeper nerves, right? I need to understand their context, so where are they, you know, how do they feel, and what is going on in their life right now that I can leverage to find the perfect gift, and very little about need. That's why socks are a really bad gift, right? And then there's the relationship that I have with the person that I'm giving something to. It's partly the relationship that we have formed, common experiences, uh, common past and also commonalities that we have. Maybe we have common hobbies or things like that, that that we can both relate to. And then up in this little corner is the giver themselves. So I have, as a giver, certain desires that I want, and I have a personality that's going to go into the gift as well. So suddenly we have a data set for the perfect <laughs> gift. And when we automate stuff, that's all we want, right? So when we think about trying to find AI, not IA. <laughs> both. <laughs> Keep doing that. <laughs> um, artificial intelligence, algorithmic <laughs> intelligence, um, to find the perfect gift. Uh, you know, it's hard, so. Yeah, Google likes to put out these little studies of like their micro moment, moments, and so I'm thinking with Google, showing this meandering journey across the internet. And the first thing you notice about this, other than the fact that it spans multiple sites, is that the person starts searching for something very different from where they end up, right? You start with this, I'm looking for something nice for my sister. You specify price, I'm looking for inexpensive Christmas gifts. But then once you, you narrow in, it becomes more brand focused and product and item focused. But because this is an iterative exchange, it's not like the first result was the magic answer. And, and because this spans multiple sites and multiple providers, you end up with a much more nuanced journey. And we want to be able to take that journey and map it, not just across sites, but we want to map that emotionally and see what that, that real interaction is, is happening. So we took the liberty to map out the user journey of gifting. 
Um, essentially what is happening here, right, on this side, it's a journey about the giver, but it doesn't end at the giver, it then continues for the gifted. And what you have here is all the activities, right? In the defining of the gift, I'm trying to catch hints. I'm trying to memorize, you know, ideas as they come up <laughs> in specific situations. I'm like, oh, this is great. I have to remember this. And maybe I'm, as anal, as keeping a list of ideas, right? Um, then I find the gift, so I'm either buying it online, I know what it is and it's easy to find, or I hunt for it in different stores, online or offline, because I'm trying to find that perfect thing. Um, I budget and pay for it. Then I prepare it, so I track the delivery, I wrap the gift, I contextualize it with a little card or something that remember when, blah, blah. And then I give it. I give it either to the person in person or I give it remotely. I'm either alone with that person or in front of others. Um, and I then await, await the reaction. So all of this is a crazy emotional journey, right? From highs and lows, you know, I have a great idea, that's fantastic, I'm stressing out, I have no idea, to, oh, I found it, or it's impossible to find, and it's very expensive, anything that prevents me from actually being able to get it. Um, then the idea while I prepare it, oh my God, they love it, um, or the idea that it might not arrive in time, right? Um, I can't wait to see their face, they're really gonna love it, and I'm not so sure anymore if it's the right gift. And then on the receiving side, there's the receiving, the immediate reaction, the emotional reaction, then the evaluation and exploration of this gift, and then, you know, the thank you, you're gonna do that anyways, and then utilizing that gift. Are you gonna use it? Are you gonna toss it? Or are you gonna return or exchange it, right? And this emotional journey is also pretty intense because Either I'm really surprised, how did you know, this is fantastic, and it becomes my favorite, or I'm down there in the what the fuck corner where I'm like, how, what, really? <laughs> Which I can't say because I need to thank the person and it's awkward and so forth. So, opportunities for automation, especially, this is the goal, right? No more what the fuck. And especially <laughs> on this side, here is the, the opportunities are for finding the right gift, for getting the right gift and getting it in time, right? These are the three most or deepest valleys in the emotion curve, so this is where we can tap in. We're gonna do this in three steps. <laughs> uh, the first one is... Uh, again. Yeah, so this one gets a little complicated. So just like we have the emotional journey, this is like the mathematical journey, and without going into detail on this, there are really two things you gotta think about. One is, What's our feature vector? What are, what are we actually modeling on? What are the inputs to the model? Because one of the first things we're going to find out as we go into this is that it's really hard to predict a gift for somebody if the predictive features you have aren't relevant. I mean, all those emotional peaks and valleys and risks, those each represent a risk not just for the people, but also for any algorithm trying to make the prediction. And then the second phase of any of these predictions is the recommendation itself. You have to actually run this individual through this model you built and then come out with a score that's presented to them in some meaningful way. So this kind of construct informs any model, and the model all has to be optimized towards a goal. And we're gonna come back to this in a moment because that's one of the principal challenges here. First, we're trying, gonna get the right data in order to, you know, do this model. Uh, we need all of these pieces, so that's a lot. At least as many of them as we can get. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question is explicit versus implicit inputs. Explicit means someone, we ask someone, what do you want specifically, what do you like, da da da. Implicit is we find that out ourselves. And there's trade-offs to both. Yeah, and these trade-offs are really tricky because basically, think about it in your gift shopping experience. Like a lot of these gift recommendation services start by asking you how much you want to spend. But how many of you have had the experience of spending much more than you expected to because you found the perfect gift? Or like you spent less than you expected but you were nervous about the perceived value, whether the person receiving that gift would look at it and say like, oh, are they going to think I was too cheap? Um, and there's also stated affinity versus contextual signals. So stated affinity is when you ask, does a person like sports? And that's a very kind of like blunt instrument, right? Because sometimes when you're looking for spontaneity and discovery, like those types of stated signals end up cutting the, the conversation off too soon. Versus contextual signals, kind of observing behaviors and watching people as they interact with their, their content and with their uh, entertainment and whatnot, um, those, are, those can be very precise. 
but they violate perceptions of privacy. So one of the other concerns here, and a lot of the early gift recommendation services that try to connect to Facebook, both face the privacy barrier and the fact that the stuff that we state explicitly on Facebook isn't all that predictive from a gifting perspective. So they came up on a bunch of these different barriers. Oh yeah, and the, there's also this race to the lowest common denominator, which is demographics. That very often there's this initial thing of like, well, who are you shopping for? Is it a man or a woman? And I think that what this really misses, and the point here, in addition to the fact that it's just really kind of insulting, is that we, we miss out on so much in our attempts to capture what is most generic about us. We're trying to avoid risk here. You, you end up like missing a lot of that opportunity for ambiguous, spontaneous, like the gray areas are where a lot of these greatest surprises pop up. And if we're kind of like doing the dumb thing where we're going to choose the most obvious cuts, we lose a lot of that, that spontaneity. Because then we can basically go back to this, right? Why don't you just tell me what you want? <laughs> oh, the magic gone. Just, if, you, if you already asked me, like, are you a man or a woman, or are you, do you like sports or what? Like, just, just tell me. So, I mean, we think about some of the research which is going on most recently about this. So, one of some of the more recent patents are trying to find ways to use plain text. And that's really the one takeaway from this is, what if I could just kind of describe what I'm looking for and just kind of like do that either aloud using my voice or via text query, which is where a lot of chatbots are coming in, where their ability to assimilate text and give you some kind of useful response. So rather than saying, I'm shopping for an 18 to 24 year old man, you can instead just describe what you think this person might like and then parse that and give me ideas. So this is where the, the newer innovations are happening. So if we're thinking about all of this and we think, okay, how can we actually automate it? We could automate it, but we need the right sources, yeah. right? If I would read your Amazon profile and try and get out of that what you want, you would get toothpaste. So the right data, we think, is somewhere in a, the digital world that I actually already pre-curated or that it is aspirational, right? Pinterest, for many people, the boards are mood boards, are aspirational boards of where they want to go, renovating a kitchen or whatever, or food things. These are kind of curated boards, happy places, filled with things that fuel my aspiration of who I want to be. Instagram, similar. We never show you know, our real life on Instagram, our crying kids, they're always happy. So there's, there's a level of curation in that and a level of, you know, um, editorial control over who I want to be, the persona I want to be perceived as, that it could serve as an input into aspirational gifting. There's also a lot of metadata available for these different inputs, like things like, like geography and timestamps for, um, for Instagram, or even things like you know, the genre and other like, artist metadata available for music, um, or even from Pinterest, whether it's anything from the retailers to the styles to the color palettes. It's very rich data to mine. And Spotify, we, we discussed a lot, and there's a reason why it doesn't just say Spotify, <laughs> because I might listen to country music, but if you give me a country <laughs> music CD, I shoot you. Um, there is a level, there's, that's where the, the, the line is so interesting between the curated, you know, playlist that I put out there that I want to be perceived as or associated with, and the truth of what I'm actually doing. And that's the difference that we have to find if we use automated sources of inspiration for the gifts. It's not what you do and who you really are. It's about who you want to be, and that we probably have a better shot. Yeah. Much more powerful than 18 to 24 year old male. Or toothpaste. Or toothpaste. <laughs> <laughs> so then if we look at the relationship data, the other side of it, right? What, what do we have here? How do we understand the relationship between two people? We have their Facebook relationship, we have maybe <laughs> We know all that Facebook doesn't really know your real friends because you never communicate with your real friends through Facebook. So what is it? Is it text messages? Is it email? Is it WhatsApp? Well, we get into a big trouble problem. There's a creep line with data. Y'all probably heard that term. The idea that data and the exposure of the knowledge of that data becomes ridiculously creepy and people are not ready for it. Well, if we go into text messages, email, WhatsApp, which is a lot of the data we have, it becomes, it's so far beyond the creep line, it should actually not be on the slide anymore. What's interesting is, I mean, think about how much of this type of data we give up for convenience and automation now. 
We don't think about it, but every time you use Gmail and your, your, the, the text of your messages is being scraped and analyzed by Google, like, we, we prefer to kind of ignore the fact that some of these things is hap- are happening right now. But from a standpoint of, of opting into a recommendation service, there's an initial resistance to like, ooh, maybe that's just one step too far, or two or three. Hmm. So that's a couple of data input sources for the first set, right? How could we get the right data? So we have a couple of options here. The second idea is, okay, what is a true automation process? And we think in the sense of gifting, it should be machine-aided but user-curated. So it is not a true complete automation because if we do a true complete automation, we're here, right? Once again, we're in the generic space, in the space where everyone ends up with that is like harmless, that is, you know, safe. (laughs) Now I know what not to get, Sophie, for Christmas. Okay, not what I want. Don't give me this. Um, because what we want to do is we want to keep the magic. And we can't and want to delegate the personal aspect of gifting. It's very important that we keep that. So, you know, there might be a hybrid approach. Yeah, and we've seen some companies, and this is a a retailer in uh, in the UK, Argos, that's trying to do this kind of combination approach, where if you see what what you do, you start by giving them a little bit of information just to get them started, and then what you do is you do kind of like a Tinder-like swiping thing, where they'll start recommending, but then as you provide inputs to like more of that, less of this, more of this, until you find the right thing, you're training the algorithm basically with this type of discovery process. So it's it's taking something which has been proven out in another category, being dating, and now applying it to this hybrid model of semi-automated gifting. Um, Only one problem with this is that for some reason they've actually disabled access to this object. And I think that one thing I did a whole separate speech about is people sometimes like to trick these recommendation tools and and AI tools. And I I actually caught myself wondering whether whether maybe they had taken this down in part because you almost feel tempted to try to trip it up and give it input so it recommends offensive things. So I'm, I'm wondering if that may have happened. But they've actually pulled this down even though it's current for the holiday season. So if we look at it, these are the pieces that we probably want to have control over, right, in this journey of of gifting. So yes, the algorithm finds the right gift, but I add to the ideas, to your point. I tweak the algorithm, I teach it, and I can put my own inputs in, which always have a different ranking than a machine input, right? When the algorithm found a gift or found a couple of gifts, I want to confirm that selection, otherwise I end up with a, with a teddy bear, and I want to make sure that this is something that is, you know, right for that person. And then the whole beauty of giving, like all of this around here, I probably want to keep that in my hand. The wrapping, the contextualizing, and the giving itself. These are the pieces that make it magic for me as a giver as well. So, oh. good. <laughs> we've, got, we've got one last problem. Any of you who've ever worked in data science or kind of built algorithms know that you have to teach it. It needs stuff to learn from. You need to optimize towards a goal. And part of the problem is that all of these outcomes that Sophie just talked about, of the delight of opening the gift and like, oh, how do you know me so well, those all take place offline. So we have an attribution problem, right? That, that the moment of joy or the moment of failure is largely invisible to any algorithm that can be written to automate gifting, right? Because it's not just about your transaction with yourself and your satisfaction, it's about the reaction of that other person. So um, w- one way of thinking about this, we started with this uh, discussion about returns, of like the fact that 30% of online e-commerce gifts are returned, just an astonishing percentage. So, like, that's already a big economic problem, and it's really big for companies like UPS, who are thinking about, like, from a user experience standpoint, what are the implications of all these returns? I mean, if 30% of people not only suffered the indignity of receiving a bad gift, but now have to go through the hassle, the difficulty of, um, of, of returning it. And so you have companies like Amazon, on the next slide, that are trying to get one step ahead of this. So this is anticipatory disappointment, and this is, this is absolutely true. This is a patent that Amazon filed um, uh, in the last year in which they try to anticipate when a gift is being sent to you whether you will hate it. And if they think you're going to hate the gift, they say, don't send the gift and convert it to a gift card. Or if they think, well, you know, maybe you'll like the gift, then they'll notify you. They'll let you know, well, you have a gift coming from this person. Do you want to accept it or decline it? So they've shifted this burden 
to the recipient, but trying to get one step ahead of the return shipping problem, which costs Amazon a lot of money. So there are really interesting kinds of economic incentives here to make sure that the gift is kind of pre-accepted, even if they're not recommending it to you directly. Kind of an interesting way to thread the needle. So the way we're going to train this machine, then, has got to include some interesting kind of factors. We have some interesting op options available to us. We could look at whether the gifts are returned, right? Because if you know the gift was returned, then maybe the recommendation wasn't so good. Um, whether people bragged about getting it. I mean, these are like the unboxing videos or people kind of like, if you know the person who got the gift, then talked about how great the gift was, that's a good sign. There's, you could ask people, you could send, especially if you're sending a gift to someone, you could ask the recipient, hey, was this a gift you enjoyed? We won't tell the person who sent it, but we just, we want to know. We're just kind of curious to make sure you were satisfied with the experience. Or, I love Sophie's idea here, you could look at the changes in the relationship status of the people who sent and received the gift. So if they broke up, yeah, maybe not such a good idea. If they got engaged, ooh, nice job. <laughs> So there are all kinds of cues that could help a model that otherwise doesn't have a lot of source of learning and, and give it a way to improve itself over time. That's the only way these recommendation services actually get better is if they have this type of feedback to help them. So happy holidays, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> That's all we got. And uh, we have a couple of thought stories, but open up for discussion. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> With my chance to sit down on this couch. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Something I used to do with my best friends. Oh, sorry. Something I used to do with my best friends is just analog-wise. I would just take a bunch of pictures from online, whether it's a concert or a pair of sneakers or a sweatshirt, mm. send them this pictures, and they pick one. <laughs> So, like, wouldn't that be an example of something they could do, like have five or six examples and they pick one that's in your yeah. range? And yeah. Yeah, that would be, I think this, this thing that we were trying to find in the UK does a little bit of that, right? With the idea of sending you random stimuli, essentially, yeah. and you saying yes, no, which is really yeah. the easiest interaction from a user perspective. Also, very slow learning process from a machine, I would say, because it's a lot of different things in a binary. I think when we talked about, about registries, and like registries are only, um, are, are really only appropriate in, in, in like American culture mostly for like very specific events. Like it's okay for a wedding, it's okay for, a, for like a new baby or something like that. But by and large, we don't want to be too prescriptive. And some people just totally chafe against that. So I think what, what you've articulated is this kind of nice middle ground. We are sending, like for us as designers, like, the, like you're sending a mood board effectively to your friend, or like Pinterest might do the same thing in terms of your collections. And it's a way for you to provide hints, but they're not like declarative. They're more like implying. That's a nice thought. They're nudges, yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering if you two had heard of the company Karma. Oh. So, uh, so Karma was like a gift finder on the front, oh. um, but they, would, they wouldn't process the order and they would let the person know you know, you know, Bob has bought you a gift for $25. Yeah. And if you decide you didn't want the gift, you could instantly convert that. Either you pay it forward to somebody else or just donate that money to a charity. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so, so no, the, I never the, heard the of person that. still has the reward of got, getting a gift and yeah. like a, a good experience on their end, even if the gift was, was horrible. Yeah, I did at one point think about like there, there are a bunch of like of gifting models like Heifer International has a great one where it's like it's trying to make the charity experience a little more shopping like. So you, you get like an artifact, like you get a pretty card that goes to that person, but it, it's trying to create this experience of where you get to shop creatively for somebody, even if the destination of that money is to a charity, it, it makes it seem more tangible. I know there were studies done about happiness, and part of the thing is anticipation mm. in terms of planning for a vacation or a trip, and that was the most uh, enjoyable part of it, rather than actually <laughs> doing the vacation or after vacation. It's the anticipation of that. So, mm. does any of that play a role in gift giving? There's this anticipation. Mm of finding or getting yeah. the right thing? Is it like a, a shopping thing that... Yeah, I think, I mean, I think to a certain degree it does, except because 
the vacation study that, or the studies around vacation that you mentioned is, is um, I would say, a little bit of a different use case because I'm doing something for myself in a place very far in the world of escapism. Mm -hmm. Because the gifting is something where I'm specifically trying to A, read another person, and B, interpret that person into a tangible object. It's, the journey goes in both directions, right? It's a high anticipation of, if I'm sure and I'm optimistic, I think it's the right thing, yeah. and a deep level of anxiety to say, what if it's not? I just spend all this time, I spend all this money, and I don't know this person at all. So it's, there's definitely, I think, part of it, because giving is something that is very, um, makes you feel very good, right? When you but also vulnerable. And also very vulnerable, exactly. But when you do get it right, it's a beautiful moment, an absolutely fantastic moment. But the anxiety yeah. journey there is a little bit bigger than the idea of yeah. planning a vacation, which is an escapist dream. You know? It's funny, from, from a UX standpoint, like you think about like the like anticipation good, anxiety bad. Yeah. Like how do you, like in, in an experience like this, how you, how, how you create the most, like can you have one without the other? Like is part of the anticipation necessarily rooted in the anxiety? Yeah, or how can you reduce one because you're more sure, right? Yeah. That, I mean, that's the whole idea. Yeah, I mean, because you, you'd, you'd want these tools, right? The, the reason why you'd use them, other than convenience, is to feel like you'd found a better gift, like an objectively, like, this gift, I think, will make this, my, my, the recipient happier. And so the question is, like, does the removal of doubt change the degree of anticipation? If you pretty much knew they were going to like it better, it's kind of... Thinking loud. Wouldn't that be like more of an issue of control? Because they would like to feel like they're in control. But this is something they can't control. It's which is someone else's feeling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's the but, but we're seeding control in all kinds of places. I mean, I think the, 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 the interesting thought experiment of this this idea is that like there's so many other parts of our lives that we have seeded to algorithms. And this is one of the few where whether we could or should, we, we've so far held pretty much for ourselves. Hi. Hi. You got the mic. <laughs> yeah. So what I was wondering was, do you guys have data before returns were so easy, before we could send it to Amazon and right back the next day? Um, is it that returning has become so easy and the fact that it's basically free, that people are sending back gifts, so regardless of what machine helps us? We might run into this problem where people just send back gifts because it's that easy. I mean, I think what you're, what you're asking is interesting because the question is, is the, is the ease of the process a, or is the high number of returns a symptom of the ease of the process, meaning we're never satisfied. You know, next year is going to be 50% because we don't even want to get gifts. Well, then we're fucked. <laughs> but the other idea is, um, you know, is there a possibility that before I, it was so easy to return the gifts, I still didn't like it. I just now had it sitting on my, I don't know, credenza or whatever. So I think that's the two questions that are in there. I don't know. I had the experience of being over at a, a client who's a, a, a national retailer who I want to identify, and we, were, we had talked about like this idea of, well, maybe we could aid more frictionless returns. So like the, somebody would come and pick up the return for you. And they were like, no, 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 no. The returns are a great thing because it gets people into the store. Like, so from their standpoint, I think that the, that the Amazon equation is different because Amazon incurs the cost, but for a physical retailer, they actually get the revenue. For them, this is actually a, a disappointing gift can actually result in more revenue for them than a successfully accepted gift, which kind of blows your mind a little bit on what incentives that creates. But, like, but I think that there probably are some interesting dynamics there around how returns mean something different in the age of Amazon uh, than they did when it was all physical retail. You got the mic. I, I didn't anticipate the anxiety that came with this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hope I get this out correctly. Um, I, my question is based on, I guess, I think that the practice of minimalism and kind of that social consciousness is gaining momentum, at least in the vacuum that I live in, it is. And uh, I was wondering, do you run data on intangible gifts based on experiential purchases, of which are also easy to return? Yeah. Uh, and don't have the environmental impact mm. or economical impact of returning? Yeah. So 
So we talked a lot about this while we were while we were making this, and it is a, what you're asking is extremely interesting, and I. Um, I do find different data around this trend of experience over things, yeah. right? Because, um, yes, the idea and the, and the direction that we are all going in is the idea that experiences is what matters and um, gifting experiences per like the, the easiest home run for a unique gift, right? Because it is going to be unique because it's a thing, an experience. And all of this data is based on, on tangible things because it's yeah. the, the revenue, the, 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 the money value on the tangible things. Um, interestingly enough, there is a little bit of a mixed thing around the idea of experiences over things um, because it comes from a place of having things, not from a place of not having things. And the moment you probe a little bit deeper, uh, people say, no, 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 don't get me wrong. I want the the things, they, they should be set, but the idea of things as statuses is not the same anymore. And gifts plays, funny enough, in neither section. It's not the things I need, right? But it's also not the things necessarily that give me status. So it's, it's almost a weird in-between between space, even with the, with the physical, tangible things. But um, have we done any studies specifically? Not that I recall. I, I know I've looked into gift cards before, and, and the whole gift card industry is a little related to this, and the sense of like, well, I don't want more stuff, just give me a gift card. And you think about the emotional context of a gift card, how different that arc is from the journey that Sophie showed. You know, where, where in a tangible, specifically curated gift, you've got this risk. And really what a gift card does is just kind of flattens out the lines. Right? You, the, 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 the odds of surprise and delight are greatly reduced, but so is the risk of utter disappointment and like, and, and, you know, you know it's like, so I think that there's, that experience gifts are kind of, are, are a special case, but I think you can certainly find people who want, who don't want stuff, finding alternative vehicles to exchanging gifts. And that, that there's good data on that for sure. But I'd, I'd love to do look more at experiences though. Yeah, I would find it interesting to see just you know, the return rate between experiences and, you know, tangible gifts, like yeah. what happens there? Because returning, you know, an experience is very awkward. <laughs> or, or you just I don't, don't, or you just don't use it, you kind of let it lapse. Yeah. Um, my wife and I were giving each other a hard time about the fact that I'd given her this, like, some yoga classes and she'd given me some massages and neither of us had used them, utterly defeating the purpose of the gift, <laughs> right? So it's like, but, but you do run that risk. Like, the that's the equivalent of the rejection is lapse. Yeah. Um, your data opens up for like gift giving in terms of purchasing, but what about gift giving? Like if you want to create something for someone, mm. so would you be able to teach um, AIs to like teach you how to create something for the, um, the gift? Oh, interesting. You mean like <laughs> make the gift yourself or have in, a, someone... in a sense? Yeah, uh, I think the the so mm. um, I work with a startup that tries to connect makers to people who want something made. Mm. And gift giving is one of their biggest things, but it turns out that people are much less creative than they think they are. So <laughs> no one will ever make anything from scratch that was a complete dud, but people do want to customize. And that's a very interesting niche, right? Like, yeah. you're like, oh, I'm, you know, customize this handmade scarf by putting the initials in the corner, and you feel as good as having design the whole scarf yourself, and you give it to someone, and it's all of a sudden a very unique gift. Poor sucker can't return it, right? But at the same time, there's a... But, the, but I could be disappointed. I mean, I, I can certainly... I, it, it amplifies... Like the, the, we talk about like the, the gift cards flattening. This is like the amplification the thought, of, yeah. and risk and yeah. vulnerability. Yeah. Suddenly, like the rejection, a person can't even reclaim that value. It's yeah. just gone. But people, to, to your point, like, I think the idea is beautiful. It doesn't scale well because people really are just... Uh. Yeah, but I'll, but I'll bet that there are examples of kind of like, if we thought about that some more of, 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 and especially given some of the social trends around like just less stuff, more experiences, of like what are ways of helping people, maybe who, who haven't had the experience of creating something, of just helping them down that creative path, that would be kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So... I have a question. If you have all this data on the recipient and even the gift giver, how do you then pair that with products? Like, how do you actually connect that to products in a meaningful way? To the right product? Yeah. 
Yeah, there, there's a lot of. I mean, I mean, a lot of um, a lot of this is about finding the appropriate stitching point. Like, I mean, if you're Amazon and you've got tons of sales data and tons of demogra- data about that individual, both demography, geography, and otherwise, you've already got those things. The challenge is that feedback loop, to the extent that you create positive experiences, has a network effect that really benefits large retailers. Right, because they've got a lot of customers, they've sold a lot of products, so they can build very effective models. The challenge is, for companies that don't already have that footprint, how it is they accumulate it. And they can accumulate it either by third-party data or they accumulate it by partnering with other organizations. And, and that's where some of the privacy implications get tricky, too. So if you were, um, this is, could be very, a very long topic in and of itself, but, like, but, but the stitching process isn't all that hard as long as you already have the data to stitch. And that's, that's a lot of the, the economic value of, of, of recommender services. Like Netflix is great because it has this amazing history of people who liked X also liked Y. But I think a lot of the, you know, the data sources that we, we talked about as, as potential examples are shoppable anyways, right? Um, Pinterest and the buy button is an experiment. So if I have a certain thing on Pinterest that I like, the algorithm could weed out things that come up over and over or draw conclusions around, you know, things that I would want. Um, Spotify is shoppable. Like, you know, I can <clears throat> buy these music or I can create a playlist for someone that I gift them, you know. And the in-between of, of, the, of the Pinterest, it's, it's really a level of data or of, of raw data um, interpretation and recognition. Okay. So. You know, what can you find in my Pinterest feed? What can uh, photo recognition software see that is there that is actually either purchasable or giftable? In uh, shoppable music like that is a, is a really interesting example of like micro gifting, where you're kind of, you can actually create more, because it's spontaneous or maybe like outside of the context of expected gifting, you can imagine its emotional journey is being quite different because like, because it is unexpected and it is purely thoughtful and more kind of occasion driven. So there's where like that relationship of, of actual cost versus perceived value might be radically different for a gift of a song than it would be for a gift of a physical object. Uh, over here to your right along the wall. Hi, sorry. Hi. Um, this is a small point, but you brought up that as part one of your data points for it seeing if it worked, if the algorithm worked, you could see a relationship status change, either for better or for worse. Um, in any of your data sets, have you actually been able to correlate the two? Um, and if not, do you think it's a viable option for predictions? I know that Facebook has done some work on, on, on looking at relationship changes to other, like, um, I remember seeing some data on um, uh, showing where you are in the arc of your relationship based on the, um, based on friend and communication patterns. So basically, like, what are predictors that your relationship is about to end based on how it is you change your patterns of of friend communications. Like, you have an intense burst of activity communicating with people that are distinctly your friend as opposed to her friend. So there's definitely been predictive work on that. And like, I, I can only imagine you could do the same thing. It's just like, it's again, it's, a, it's about that creep line, right? And you can do it, but in the same way that Facebook got in a lot of hot water when it turned out they were manipulating people's moods by playing, pulling the levers on their news feeds, um, you, you run a great risk of, of having a much greater risk than, than benefit. And I think from a UX perspective, it's all incumbent upon us to really think about this from a standpoint of what's best for the user, not always what's best for the, the economic outcome. In I'm, the long term, they're aligned. Yeah, I'm surprised about the possibility of attribution models because I would think the same thing. I'm like, that has very little to do with a gift. And the fact that you can actually attribute these kinds of things to a certain level of granularity that we're not fully aware of is, is, is interesting and scary at the same time, yeah. but it does, it is possible. But you also have to understand these data sets are so huge. When you've got a platform that has, you know, 200 million, 500 million, a billion users, even small effects become really observable and quantifiable over a given period of time. Uh, right here and to the right in front. Yes, I had a question about in terms of donating to causes, because you often see mm. that in like, in lieu of flowers or something like that, what are mm. the thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we touched on that a little bit with the idea of making what, you know, what falls <laughs> flat in the idea of gifting to causes is the excitement of the recipient. Yeah. <laughs> because there's really nothing that the recipient, aside from feeling good about this, which they haven't initiated, right, can, uh, you know, 
they, they can't feel understood, they can't feel, um, you know, personally surprised or things like that. The inherent pieces of a gift fall flat. Yeah. So giving to charity in the name of someone is not a gift, I'm sorry. But in that world, what can we do to make it a gift? Well, right? it's, it's not a physical gift, but I think the, it, it's about the emotional journey, right? Yeah. And so what you've done is you've reduced, by taking it out of the physical domain or, or making it like a, an individual gift, you've reduced risk. What you're really doing is you're, re, re, you're minimizing the emotional, um, uh, the downside, because you've stipulated, I want, I want this gift or this money or the, in lieu of flowers. So it's a, it's a, it's, what you've done is you've eliminated the negative, but you've diminished the amplitude of the positive. So for example, in the case of like the in lieu of flowers, if I had um, made dinner for you and I brought food over for you, that might be more emotionally meaningful than had you donated to the cause. So you have more emotional upside on the spontaneity. But directed giving, just like any kind of registry, I, I do think it reduces the emotional amplitude. But so the challenge with this is either, you know, to infuse the feeling of being gifted into this process. So what can I actually, how can I share a strong mm. feeling of, of feel good? How can I contextualize the idea that something great is happening in the world because these $25 are going to somewhere? Yeah. Share that with the receiver, right? With the gifted. If I can do that, then you do have that happy moment. You might not have that same level of surprise and that, that kind of very, you know, selfish level, but you do have an idea of a, a feel-good moment that you bring together. But right now, we're just not doing it. Right now, we're like, a donation has been made in your name. Mm. Great. But is there anything that can be yeah. I think it can, I think it can be very sincere, but it won't be surprising. And so part of this question is the question about anticipation of like how much of the joy of receiving a gift or giving a gift is in that anticipation and anxiety. So you can still have the satisfaction of knowing your gift went to a good cause, but you won't have the surprise and delight factor. So I, I think it's, there's probably something that honestly that the causes themselves could learn from this. If how could you create more of this anticipation and this emotional engagement and therefore boost giving by simulating gifting? To your left in the middle. Awesome. We thought the same thing, and that's the question then is, yeah. um, the question is, and that's where A, I think the stop gates of the human being come in, because otherwise, you know, chocolate, everyone likes chocolate, doesn't mean you know me, I actually don't like chocolate, so don't. <laughs> yeah. but Depends what chocolate I give you. It doesn't mean you know me, right, there's, a, there's again a lowest common denominator of like, what is knowing. However, if you yeah. utilize the algorithm, right, and the algorithm finds insights, nuggets about things that you want that you didn't know, and you can then, as the, as the giver, you know, be able to say, oh, this is actually something I relate to as well. This is something that I had an idea, but I didn't know, but they mentioned yeah. it sometime, and I forgot, da, da, da. Yeah. Then you have a machine that's helpful. But, but this is an optimizable phenomenon. Like, you could actually <laughs> have a slider, like in your interface, that said, do I want a safer gift? Or a riskier gift. I mean, and seriously, in terms of like, the, there are other examples that are like this where I, you know, I think that what makes it the you know me effect is largely a function of risk. It's because somebody went out on a limb with something very specific, but you could tell the algorithm to do that too. I mean, I think it's, this is again, in terms of the other parts of our life that we feel free delegating to recommender services. Um, I look at like vacation recommendations as being an interesting example of this. You know, where it's something which is very personal, and you can absolutely like show me a place I would never have thought of to go before, and and you know it'll it won't be the same as how did you know I always wanted to go to Malta, but but it could definitely simulate that experience. So it's kind of a strange question: what you're optimizing for? To your right near the front, and I'm the last. I no, I got it. I. I don't think this is the most interesting last question, but we're talking about gift cards and we're talking about giving to causes. So where does gift subscriptions fall in that? Oh, gift subscriptions are awesome. A gift that keeps on giving. Because, 
I think gifts descriptions start to hit something that is right there in the middle. I have declared an interest, yeah. right? So I like cosmetics, I like uh, X, Y, Z. I've declared an interest and I have declared the willingness to be surprised. Hmm. And then on the other side, the gifts that come in, it's not one. You have canceled your subscription if you get one thing once a month. You're like, screw, you have no, whatever. <laughs> so you cancel that. But it is an array of things opening up the possibility of being the right thing tremendously just by sheer math, yeah. right? So it's a beautiful thing. I have opted in to be surprised in an interest area that I like and I get enough fodder back to have something there. That might be the right thing. We, we've seen a huge surge in e-commerce of like these these different box services of like you know where, where it arrives and like it's a different mix of cosmetics or various things. And what you've effectively done there is be, when you subscribe to a service like that, you're subscribing to be surprised every time. And so that way, even if the last one that came was kind of a dud, you still tell yourself, well, maybe the next one will be really cool. So there's, there's something you're interesting about... You're subscribing to the surprise. Yeah, you're subscribing to surprise, but you're also subscribing to risk. I mean, at a certain point, your dread would outweigh the anticipation, or at least you become skeptical of that value, but it creates this kind of like a do-over effect, you know, where you get kind of like another shot at this to a, to a degree. But, but there's something interesting about, like, the, the, the risk is one time, but the reward is iterative. Mm. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. That to me, well, what you're mentioning is, is pretty risk-free, right? The magazine subscriptions or something, it's like, it's the registry model. Okay. Just give me this magazine. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. great. A cooker with it? Yeah. Yeah, but, in, in, but, this, but the, the immediate surprise, you've just spread the emotions out over time yeah. as opposed to having, like, the big moment of anticipation. Yeah, that's true. Uh, to your far left in the middle. Hey. Hi. So two questions. Um, how and why did each of you start thinking about this? <laughs> and then two, fast forward 10 years, what does gift giving look like? Well, I know why I started thinking about this. I, I'd, I'd been asked to do a number of different kind of AI speeches, and I'm actually not an AI person, but I, I'm really fascinated in terms of AI, like from a programming and development standpoint. But I'm fascinated by the impact of like AI on society at a societal level, and I've been exposed to some thoughts around like this notion of generosity and greed and kind of like fundamentally human emotions. And then when I, I heard the date for this event, I was like, that's kind of coming up on Black Friday and the holiday season. I wonder how AI and gifting are going to collide, and when will that happen? And I was struck, I think, first, the first thing I discovered as I started thinking about it is these were fundamentally emotional and cultural journeys as much as they were mathematical. And, uh, and Sophie and I had been talking about this notion of how many of these new services are just kind of babysitting you. Like they're, kind of, they're, they're taking away things which you as an adult should be responsible for, like you know, laundry or cooking food, and they're, they're, they're kind of infantilizing you. And I, I kind of wondered if the same principle might apply in gifting, where this is supposed to be an expression of yourself, an abstraction of yourself even, and are we basically like delegating our most intimate expressions to people that we should actually be dedicating sincere thought and, and interest? And I started thinking about it because Michael thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> There's two things for me that, that kind of came together with this. First, I thought about gifting because I'm the worst gift giver. I don't give gifts. Mm. Um, no, I really just don't do it. And uh, I don't expect them. And it's always a little bit uncomfortable for me. It's, it's, I, I don't have any kind of like, you know, emotional... Uh, fulfillment from giving a gift, gift. and I, I thought about why this is in this touches on your second question and um, the other part is that that I am thinking a lot about AI and I'm thinking a lot about the emotional um, component of artificial intelligence and where this should go and because gifting is an emotional process I thought it was very interesting to what you're asking about whether or not gifts are going to be or what it's going to be in 10 years I do think that they go away and the reason why I think this is because the social and political necessity of them is, has gone away. It is not necessary for me to bring material things to someone in order to manipulate them. 
anymore. And I think as a you know, society that gets wealthier and that, that has the basic needs covered, the idea of gifting definitely in the physical space is a little bit further on the outs. And what you said as well about the idea of giving experiences and things like that, you almost stop having to need a moment or a, a trigger to give these experiences. So you don't need to wait for Christmas to give someone, you know, a nice dinner out or something like that or a massage. So I think the whole idea of, of gifting and gifting occasions and, and physical gifts are going to shift. And I realize I didn't answer the, the, the 10-minute question, or the, the 10-year question. So I, I, um, if you all, I'm sure most of you saw Her, or many of you saw the movie Her, I think it was about that three years ago. And um, I, I subscribe to the view that your, your agent, you know, right now, like everyone has the same Siri or the same Alexa, right? But that your agent or your avatar will effectively function as an extension of you. And that 10 years from now, having your agent do gift shopping for you would be a wholly accepted phenomenon because your agent is an intensely personal extension of yourself and your relationships. So I, I would be astonished, frankly, if, um, if a significant component of the population were not using a, an AI artifact embodiment for gifting and all kinds of other applications. But, but it won't feel like you're... It, it won't feel like you're delegating because it'll be seen as a part of you. The, the, those constructs will be largely inseparable, which is itself kind of disturbing, but I, but I, I do believe it'll happen. Right down the middle, right here. Hi. Um, so I think we've sort of touched about it a couple of times now in the past couple of questions. Uh, my question's related to our privacy. Um, at what point do you think in the future will we sort of when will we cross that, like you said, creeper line? When will it be like acceptable to get like the perfect gift, or like maybe perfect playlist or perfect soulmate? But at what cost do you think that'll be something that we'll have to deal with? Is it something that you think we'll have to? I don't know. Just like so, regarding uh, yeah. privacy and like where we might end up. So there is only one golden rule in privacy as it starts to shape up: convenience trumps privacy. And that's unfortunately the truth right now. We as you know, humans don't regulate that very well right now. And whoever has our data is very careful yeah. not to have to make us think about it. So it is right now a gentleman's agreement, but the, the way that it's going, we use everything for free and it's not free yeah. and we forget. And it's so convenient that we don't do anything. And until someone blows up that creep line and exposes it, we're probably going to continue. Yeah. There's a significant geographic divide here. So, so Germany has the most stringent restrictions on usage of third-party data and data sharing of any country in the world. And in the US, we've been largely complacent, I think, for exactly the reason that Sophie said around that we, we really prize convenience. And I'll never forget, when I was in college, and this is 1996, that my professor, was a computer science professor who actually worked at the NSA, like what it meant to be at the NSA in 1996, and he, he asked, so imagine I gave you a way to pay for anything. You could just walk into any store, and like, it would be just like that. It would be a way to, way to just transact. And the only trade-off of that is that I would monitor every single thing you bought. I would sell all that information to the highest bidder. I would like, make all kinds of decisions and, like, you know, and evaluate you as a person. Uh, based on how it is you made those purchases. And, and like everyone in the room is like, oh, holy crap, no, I'm not going to do that thing he just said. And he pulls out his credit card. And this is back in 1996 when we weren't nearly so socialized to the, the idea of how our purchase data is being used. But the fact is we all kind of know in the back of our minds that we are giving up that right. And it is, we're given, we are signing that credit card agreement basically says they can resell that information, you know, with certain restrictions, but by and large, pretty openly. Um, and I think that just, I've not seen anything in American political discourse or civil discourse that would prevent companies from continuing down this path of treating you and your behaviors as a monetizable asset. We have very much reinforced that um, over, you know, the, especially the, the last 10 years. God, I hope this wasn't the last question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do one more? <laughs> one more question? Only, only happy questions? No. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. 
Didn't you already ask a question? No, he did, but it, it oh, okay. reminded me of something interesting. <laughs> it, you it, look similar. No. Wait, <laughs> so AI would change who knows you, right? Like right now, if you give a, a, a present to somebody and they feel known, it's because the gifter knows them. But that gets replaced with AI knows them. So the person who gave you this gift doesn't know that you like this music or whatever this is. So you don't actually I learned it, it from the AI. Right. So yeah. does that ruin the, the experience of getting a gift if you actually don't feel known by the person? Yeah. And does that therefore ruin that as a, as, as a reward of, of getting a gift? We thought about that a lot as well, right? We thought about this question of when you – something – you know, the hunt of finding the right gift, listening to this hint and then remembering it. That's some of the magic when you receive that magical gift that someone put in the thought, right? One of our, like, questions that we debated, is it actually the thought that counts? And if that is so, what's an AI to do in this story, right? Because the thought is a human thought. So we don't know. But think about all the socks you got in your life and you're like, oh, crap. So... You know, wouldn't you rather get something you like? I think being known is a really interesting kind of concept to end on. I mean, I think a lot of, we spend a lot of time talking about personalization and anticipatory design, this idea that shouldn't interfaces be able to, to create a better experience or at least a, a frictionless experience based on their recognition of you? And being known in that way technologically can be a great asset to a functional experience. The question is just, how does it differ for an emotional experience? And I think that's, that's a really legitimate question around kind of like, how will this change the way that we interact, not just with technology, but also the way we interact with each other? All right. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.